Now tonight, I want you to turn with me if you have a Bible, and I hope you do have a Bible, because I'd like for people to bring their Bibles, if you will, at night to the 10th chapter of the book of Mark, beginning at verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, talking about Jesus, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why dost thou call me good? There is none good but one, and that's God. You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not, and honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go sell whatsoever thou hast, give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hard, hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust, notice, trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. This is a great chapter, and this is a marvelous story of a young man, a young aristocrat, handsome, wealthy, young. He had everything to live for, but there was something lacking in his life, and he came running to Jesus. Something was missing that money did not answer. All of the things that he had in the world could not fill something in his heart. Now, the first thing I'd like you to notice about this young man, he came to the right person. He came to Jesus Christ. You see, Christ was the right person. He was a young man. And he was tempted in all points like as you are. Do you mean he was tempted in the same way I am? Yes, the same way. You mean he was, yes. Tempted to steal, yes. Tempted to lie, yes. Tempted with a girl, yes because he was tempted in all points like as we are. And yet he never once committed a sin. He never once gave in. But he was tempted, and the temptation was real, just as real as it is to you. So he understands the problems and the difficulties. Yes, came to the right person, the one person in the whole universe that could answer his questions and save his soul and forgive his sin and give him eternal life, he came to him. So he, had, he was headed in the right direction. He came to Christ. Then he came at the right time. Notice it says he ran. In Proverbs the 18th chapter, it says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run unto it and is safe. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near, the Bible says came with urgency. The Bible says, remember now thy creator on the days of thy youth while you're young come to Christ. Not too many people come to Christ after they're 40 or 50. It's young people that come to Christ. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, says Jesus. What an invitation. All of us are filled with some problems and we labor under some of these problems. Jesus said, come to me. But you know, he has some other statements in the fifth chapter of John that are frightening. He said, ye will not come to me that you might have life. In other words, you have a will of your own and you will not come. I can give you life, he said with a capital L. I can change your life. I can change the direction of your life. 
I can help you solve those problems. I can meet your needs, but you will not. You just put up your stubborn will. And here's what happens. Your conscience, which used to be sensitive, gets harder and harder and harder and harder until after a while it comes to the point of death so that when the Holy Spirit speaks, you can no longer hear his voice. Ye shall seek me and shall not find me. He said, there's coming a day when you will seek me, but you won't find me. There'll come a time when you'll try to get to God, but you can't. It may be too late. I don't know when we cross a line like that. I used to think we never crossed it. But I've changed my mind in reading scripture. There are too many passages that indicate that you can go too far, too long in turning Christ down. This young man hadn't done that. He ran to Christ. Now I know that youth is a difficult period. Joseph was a young man when he made him when he was made prime minister of Egypt. And David was a young man when he lay out under the stars at night writing the Psalms. And Daniel was a young man when he was made prime minister of Babylon. While you're young, make your commitment to Christ. And then the third thing, he came in the right attitude. How did he come? He fell down before Christ. He knelt before Christ. Someone said that any king or any president or any leader could walk into this stadium tonight and we might stand and applaud him or we might salute him or we might boo him or whatever however we feel toward him. But if Jesus Christ walked in, we would kneel because we recognize there's something about him that's different. King of kings and Lord of lords. He came in the right attitude. He came to Christ with an attitude of humility and confession of his own failure. And he asked the right question. He said, what must I do? But in a sense, it was the wrong question because there's nothing he can do to find eternal life. Look at that little word, do, and think about it a moment. We'll come back to it in a moment. Psychology Today, which is a big magazine in America, polled its readership what they most wanted in life. And you know, it was amazing what they most wanted. They said, we want eternal life. The average American wants eternal life. And you can only find it in Christ. But this young man made the mistake of thinking he could work for eternal life. What must I do? You can't do anything. It's all been done for you on the cross. That's why we make so much of Good Friday. That's why we make so much of the cross. That's why there's a cross on every church. That's why many people wear a cross around their neck. I have a cross embossed on their Bibles. The cross is where God gave his son and all the angels of heaven pulled their swords ready to come and rescue him. But he stayed on the cross for you. He could have come down, but he didn't. He loved you so much and he knew that the only way that you could find forgiveness of sin and salvation was by the cross. Because you see, man had sinned against God and broken God's law. And God said, in the day that you break my law, you shall suffer and die. And man has been suffering and dying generation after generation down to you and me from the time that Cain killed Abel. Wars have been going on. Man is a sinner. We're all sinners. We all need redemption. And no one could pay for another person's sin because we're all sinners. But Christ, being sinless, was able to die on that cross and take the hell and the judgment and the punishment and the death that we deserved. He took it for us. He became sin for us. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now this young man wanted a full orbed life. He was just like you. He wanted fulfillment in life. He wanted to find pleasure and happiness and joy and security. 
And he wanted a future life too. He didn't want to miss out on the future. So he asked the right question in a sense. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And he got the right answer. Jesus said, listen, Jesus said, count the cost. Count the cost. Jesus taught him that respectability is not enough. Money is not enough. It passes away. And religion is not enough. There are many people that are religious that are not forgiven of their sins. They don't have eternal life. Now the law, the Ten Commandments, could not save. If you kept that whole law all your life and broke only one commandment one time, you're guilty of all, says James. For the law was not given really to save you. God knew the law couldn't save us. The Ten Commandments can't save you. If you kept them all, all your life they could. But nobody can do that. Nobody's ever done it except Jesus. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. In other words, it is someone that takes us to Christ. I look in the law, I read the Ten Commandments, and it becomes a mirror. And I see myself as a sinner. I said, now Lord, I haven't kept that first commandment. I haven't kept the second. I haven't kept the third and the fourth all my life, all the time. Because Jesus interpreted the law differently. It wasn't just the act, but it was the intent. He said, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery already. If you hate or if you have jealousy toward your brother, you've already broken the law. Now, when Jesus quoted the commandments to this young man and said, keep the commandments, he left four of them out. And the young ruler indicated that he had kept certain ones all of his life, but he didn't mention the others. There was one commandment he could not name that he'd kept. Thou shalt not covet. Because you see, Jesus looked straight into his heart and saw that his great problem was trusting in riches. Looking to riches and looking to materialism to save him. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. In other words, you could keep the whole law and break in one point and you've broken the whole law. So this young man had done the right thing all along but now he does the wrong thing. There's no one more tragic than a man who has known power and then ends up a failure by making the wrong decision. The rich young ruler that we're talking about, when he walked away from Jesus Christ, had failed the greatest test of all. And the scripture says we read that he was sad and grieved and sorrowful. Nobody ever left Jesus happy. I've never met a person in the whole world that would shake my hand and say, I'm so happy I rejected Christ. I'm so happy I've turned down Christ. But I've met thousands on every continent that said, I'm so happy I know Christ. That ought to tell you something. There's a spiritual law of sowing and reaping. Even as I've seen, they that plow wickedness a plow iniquity and so wickedness reap the same, says the scripture. What this rich young ruler refused to do was to put Christ first in his life. This young man put Christ second. His possessions and all that they would buy for him was first. Either Christ possesses you or yourself possesses you. Which will it be? If Jesus Christ is not Lord of all, he will not be Lord at all. Tonight you have to make him Lord of all. I'm going to ask you to come to Christ while you can. Come tonight. What am I going to ask you to do? I'm going to ask you to do what 7,000 people have already done. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat 
and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I open my heart to Christ. I want him to forgive my sin. I want him to fulfill my life. I want to know I'm going to heaven. You say, but I don't understand it all. You don't have to understand anything except that you have sinned against God and you need a savior and Christ is the savior. Just come and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Help me.